Augustine's contribution to natural law theory, the difference between a kingdom and a band of robbers. H.L.A. Hart's statement of 20th century legal positivism cites Augustine as the reference for natural law's claim that an unjust law is not a law. Augustine, the towering intellect of the Western church, the theologian who set the terms on which every theologian up to and including the Protestant reformers uh, had to think, was the one through whom the natural law posited by pagan thinkers such as Plato, Aristotle and Cicero was baptised. Hart sets out in a footnote the Latin text which we he has translated as an unjust law is not a law. It reads, Nam lex ni mihi esse non vedita, quae justa non ferit. And is better translated, for a law that would, was not just would not seem to me to be a law. The quotation comes from a passage in Augustine's work on the free choice of the will, written between 388 and 395 AD. The work is presented in the form of a dialogue between Augustine and his discussion partner, Evodius. In it, Augustine suggests it would be better to declare that a law is not a law at all than to say that it is a law, but is an unjust law. Further on, Augustine says, nothing in the temporal law is just and legitimate, which human beings have not derived from the eternal law. When Augustine then adopts Ulpian's classical definition of justice, as the virtue by which each receives his due. The eternal law revealed in creation and in the Bible supplies the content for what is due to people. Temporal laws, that is to say laws made by human beings, must be derived from the eternal law, though they may, Augustine concedes, permit things for the sake of the common welfare, leaving many things unpunished and to be redressed by God. An unjust law is therefore or the early Augustine, a law which contradicts the natural law, a law which not only leaves some injustices unpunished, but which actively promotes or requires injustice. Now, why does Augustine say this? What problem was he trying to address? Augustine wasn't a philosopher of law. He wasn't a constitutional theorist. You know, on the free choice of the will, as its title suggests, Augustine was trying to understand how human beings have free will. In that context, the relevant question to ask of any law is this. Ought I to obey this law? Am I bound in conscience to obey this law? And Augustine's answer is, if the law is unjust, you ought not to obey it. Laws claim to have authority. Any law comes with the claim that obeying the law is the right thing to do. Or at least that obeying the law is not the wrong thing to do. The contemporary legal philosopher Robert Alexi calls this claim the claim to moral correctness. A law whose claim is obviously false because it's wholly unjust is totally lacking in the authority it claims to have. And therefore, the answer, all tied to obey this law, is no. Now, Augustine returned to the question of the relationship between law and justice later in his career. 20 or 30 years after he wrote on the free choice of the will, he produced his masterwork, the City of God, written between 413 and 426 AD. In that work, and in particular in Book 19, Augustine develops a sustained attack on the Pax Romana and the systemic claim to moral correctness made by the Roman Empire. Now, The City of God is not a work of political philosophy, still less is a textbook on jurisprudence. It's a work of rhetorical theology, seeking to defend Christianity against the charge that it was Christianity which was responsible for the destruction of the millennial Roman Empire. The Roman Empire claimed that its laws were just, that its laws were an almost perfect reflection of the natural law and of the law of the nations. Augustine sets out in the City of God to demolish these claims. Justice, justestia in Latin, was for Augustine already a technical theological term. It was the Latin word used to translate the Greek word by kosune, used in the New Testament writings to describe the work of Jesus Christ. Dikosune is translated in most English Bibles as righteousness, but in Latin it was translated as justice. Augustine denied that the epithet justice could be applied to the Roman Empire. Even under Constantine, the emperor who converted to Christianity and his successors. 
For Augustine, as a matter of theology, God alone is just, and true justice is to be found only in Christ. Human justice is on such a different level from divine justice that it's not even worthy of being called by the same name. Augustine's conclusion was therefore that only a perfect society, only a heavenly city, could properly be called just. Earthly societies were united not by a common understanding of justice, but rather by the common objects of their love, whose commonality enabled the achievement of a relative degree of peace in the society. This meant that Roman courts did not dispense true justice, but enforced Roman law in order to preserve an unstable peace. Now, Augustine's refusal to ascribe any semblance of justice to the Roman Empire is rhetorical hyperbole. He's using it to make a point. Measured against God's standards of justice, Roman law fell short. For Augustine, natural law is a critical, objective standard against which any legal system can be measured. Although Augustine refused to use the term justicia with regard to the Roman Empire, he was prepared to talk about love and peace in ways which recognise an analogy between rightly ordered loves and disordered loves, between perfect peace on the one hand and imperfect peace on the other. So we might think in terms of perfect justice, which belongs only to God, but then relative justice, which has a degree of validity in stabilising human affairs. And there's one final quote from Augustine, which has continued to stimulate discussion amongst legal philosophers the present day. In book four of The City of God, Augustine asks this question. Justice being taken away, what are kingdoms but great robberies? And what are robberies themselves but little kingdoms? Now, this question is prompted by a famous story of what a captured pirate said to Alexander the Great. The text in The City of God, book four, chapter four, reads like this. Justice being taken away then, what are kingdoms but great robberies? What are robberies themselves but little kingdoms? The band itself is made up of men. It is ruled by the authority of a prince. It is knit together by the pact of confederacy. The booty is divided by the law agreed on. If by the admittance of abandoned men, this evil increases to such a degree that it holds places, fixes abodes, takes possession of cities and subdues peoples, it assumes more plainly the name of a kingdom because the reality is now manif manifestly conferred on it. Not by the removal of covetousness, but by the addition of impunity. Indeed, that was an apt and true reply which was given by Ale to Alexander the Great by a pirate who'd been seized. When that kingdom king asked the man what he meant by keeping hostile possession of the sea, he answered with bold pride, What thou meanest by seizing the whole earth? Because I do it with a petal sh petty ship, I'm called a robber. Whilst thou who does it with a great fleet art styled emperor. Well, what's the moral of this story? Is the moral that the only difference between a kingdom and a band of robbers is one of size? Is the moral that justice is the key difference between a kingdom and a band of robbers? And therefore only if a kingdom pursues justice in its laws are those laws authoritative. Nigel Simmons challenges legal positivism in his book, Law as a Moral Idea, on the basis that law is only intelligible as law, is only experienced as law rather than mere violence, insofar as it makes a plausible claim that its enactments are right. If there's no plausible reason for regarding a law as just, it's simply a declaration of the circumstances in which the government intends to impose its will. Now, my reading is that Augustine was making a more subtle and surprising point. Any organisation, in order to be successful, has to operate according to laws. Robber bands have a legal system in to say. If authority can send an agreement as to how to share the spoils break down, you end up with everyone killing everyone else, as happens in the film Reservoir Dogs. We can find in Augustine band, Augustine's Band of Robbers argument three strands or three dimensions to law's authority. First, the claim to have a right to make the rules. The robber band is ruled by the authority of a prince. Second, the claim that the rules are morally in order. The moral band, the robber band, is knit together by a pact of confederacy. So far as the division of the spoils between the members of the group is concerned, there's an agreement. And third, the rules are followed by those to whom they apply. The booty is then divided according to the law agreed on. 
What's striking about Augustine's argument is it highlights how laws and legal systems can treat some people as subjects and others as objects. Social life, even amongst a band of robbers, depends on discipline and cooperation. It requires the propagation of a view of justice with regard to the internal division of spoils, but this may be pursued at the expense of those who are not part of the band. On this reading, Augustine contends that systems of rules may constitute legal systems normative for those who benefit from them, whilst at the same time amounting to nothing more than violence towards those who are only exploited by them. To put it in blunt terms, a system which allows chattel slavery is a legal system for those who are not enslaved, but it is simply a regime of organised violence for those who are enslaved. As such, the unjust laws have no moral authority over those who are enslaved. Offering them no benefits and no protection against violence, the enslaved have no reason to obey those laws. To recap, Augustine sees justice as essential to law. Rules only amount to laws if they make a plausible claim to be morally in order. Rules which do not make such a claim are not laws. Rules which make such a claim but whose claim fails are not authoritative. They need not be obeyed. Legal systems can treat some people as subjects and others as objects. They can offer a vision of justice to which uh, those who benefit from the system uh, can enjoy, whilst also failing to prevent others from being oppressed, excluded or violated. Such laws are abhorrent because they're contrary to natural law.